All right. All right. Galatians. Galatians chapter 6. An amazing passage. I've had it on my mind all week, even while I was listening to the other preachers out in Washington. When I wasn't preaching, I couldn't help but think about this text. So look at what it says, verse 17. Galatians 6, verse 17. From henceforth, let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Let me read that one more time. From henceforth, let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Lord, thank you for the godly men that you brought to Grace Baptist. And Some of them are speakers and they, they stand up and talk. Others work with their hands and pray. And Lord, we need all of these men to accomplish your work. So Father, thank you so much for the work that's been done, the way that you provide here. And Lord, what a privilege it is to, to pastor in a church like this. So Lord, help us as we study your word now. Father, I pray that we'll try to have some kind of an understanding of what the Apostle Paul wrote by your inspiration. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to try and understand this passage today by looking at the words. That would be a helpful way to do it, right? We're going to look at these words and try and get a good understanding of what was going on in this text. The first word that I want to look at is trouble. Okay, now you young people, you young guys, look up here at me. You knew it was coming. Aaron, I saw that smile, Aaron. You knew it was coming. I, I don't know if you're listening if you're not looking at me. So we'll... Get this, all right? So look at that first word. It says, from henceforth, let no man trouble me. Let no man trouble me. Who was troubling the Apostle Paul here? Was it the Romans? Was it the pagans? Was it, who was troubling Paul at this point? It was Christians. It was people that he had sacrificed for. People that he had gone to prison for. And he was trying to witness and to preach the gospel, and these people had come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. But somebody had come in and deceived them. Someone had come in to these people who Paul had spoken with, he had given them the gospel, and someone had come in and deceived them. These are men who understood that salvation is only by grace. You can only get saved by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Is that right? Amen. Can you work for salvation? Amen. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but by His mercy, He saved us. That's it. That's it. The only way that we can have salvation is through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you add works to that, it's no longer the gospel. That's what the whole book of Galatians deals with. You can't be saved by works, and you can't serve the Lord in your own flesh. You have to do it through the power of the Holy Spirit, through His resurrection power. The whole book has been about that. So who is it that's attacking the Apostle Paul? Christians. Christians. How many of you have ever known some mean Christians? How many of you are married to one? No, don't raise your hand. But how many of you have ever known a mean Christian? We are not to behave that way. Now, praise the Lord, here at Grace Baptist Church, I don't think in our history, I don't think in our 61, 62-year history, we've ever had a church split or anything like that. But any of you who are from the South... How many of you have ever experienced a church split? Would you raise your hand? It is amazing how ugly Christians can get. Um, Andy's brother, Brian, assistant pastor in a church and serving the Lord, and all of a sudden people started getting in the flesh. And I mean, it was discouraging for a young preacher to see the way that Christians behave. It's, it's unbelievable. Is that right, Andy? And now, praise the Lord, he's, God's still got his calling on his life, and he's still serving God. It hasn't ruined Brian or anything like that. But I'll tell you, there have been a lot of young preachers who have been destroyed by people who don't act right. The pastor, one of the preachers, was from South Carolina at this meeting that I was preaching in, in Washington. And he had been out there the year before at this same meeting. And he was down by the water in Seattle. There's a place where you can go across the water and look at the skyline of Seattle, and there's kind of a park there. And he saw these two girls that were sitting there and a young man um, playing with a remote control car. And, you know, they were young adults. And so he went over and tried to give the gospel to the, to the young man. The young man wasn't having any part of it, wouldn't even acknowledge him. He walked over to the girls and he started talking to the girls and the one girl got up and walked away. And the other girl just looked at him with hard eyes 
And she said, I know all about what you're talking about. I know all about it, and I'm not interested. And he said, why? And he, she said, well, my father was a pastor in Squim, Washington. That's where we were preaching, three hours from there. My father was a pastor in Squim, Washington, and I saw the way those people treated him. My sister can't even hear the name of, the name of God now without being hurt. And she said, we're not interested in your Lord. Preacher's kids. Because of the way that Christians had treated their father. It's an amazing thing what Christians, people who call themselves Christian, it's amazing the way they can trouble someone. While that pastor was telling that story, I just sat there while he was preaching and I just started crying because of how good you are to my kids. How good you are to Laura and I. What a, we, we don't experience any of that. The only abuse Jacob gets is from me. <laughs> and Lydia needs some more abuse, so y'all be mean to her. She needs to toughen up. But I'm so thankful for the way that you behave toward us and toward each other. Are we perfect as a church? You know, sometimes do we not follow through on things that we ought to? All of those parts of the human frailty, all of our human faults are manifest at Grace Baptist Church the same way they would be at any other Bible-believing church. Those issues are here. But here we're a group of people that love the Lord and are trying to serve the Lord and are trying to give our lives to the Lord. But I wonder if you have ever been mean in your ministry as a Christian. It was believers who were doing this. They were troubling the Apostle Paul. That's How many of you just say, that's challenging. That's, that's convicting to me. What is my demeanor? I heard Larry Clayton one time say that I'm a Christian, I'm just not mad about it. Right? It's... I wonder if in our presentation of the gospel or in the way that we stand up to the culture, in the way that... I remember that on our, we do a... For those of you who aren't familiar with our work, we do a Baptist history tour. And uh, Jeff Faggart, one of our friends, runs this tour where we go to historic Baptist sites. And I hope all of you men will come with us this year in May. It's, it's going to be in Georgia. It's going to be fantastic. You all y'all need to mark your calendars for that. But we went to uh, um, Colby College. Is that what it was called, uh, Ed? Colby College? And um, it was a Baptist college when it was started, but now it's a liberal arts college with an emphasis on the word liberal. And we're walking through, and there's the gay rights flags hanging from the windows and things. And some of these pastors were getting really mad about it. And I finally looked at a couple of them, and I said, well, what do you expect? They're lost. They're not saved. They don't need our anger. They need the Lord. They need Jesus Christ. Now, now is, are there things in the culture that make us angry? Yes. But look, some college kid who's just been duped by the world, we don't need to show him anger. He needs to know the love of Jesus Christ. Those people in those colleges, they don't have any answers. They only have questions. We have the answers through the Lord Jesus Christ. And the way that we present our truth, it's so vitally important. It's, it's so important. You know, in a place like this where many people think we're a cult, how many of you have ever had that somebody say, I think you guys are a cult? You ever heard anybody say that to you here? Yeah. yeah. Look, we haven't killed any animals in here in weeks. <laughs> we haven't sacrificed children. We haven't done, you know, once a year, okay. But no, they really do. They think we're crazy. Why? Because we believe every word of the Scriptures. But what did Jesus Christ say? I have given them thy word, and the world has hated them for it. John chapter 17. So do we reciprocate the hatred of the world? No. What are we supposed to do? Love. Love. Let not your good be evil spoken of. Who was troubling him? It was Christians. Let's not be like that, Grace Baptist. Let's not be like that. Let's manifest the love and the grace of Jesus Christ everywhere that we go. See, these are people that Paul had loved. Look at Galatians 4. Look at Galatians 4. Verse 13. You know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the first. And my temptation, which was in my flesh, ye despised not nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Where is then the blessedness you spake of? 
For I bear you record that if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? It, it is amazing. It is interesting that when the preacher of the gospel speaks the truth of the word of God to Christians, how they can respond in hatred. They can treat you like an enemy. And many of you have, have received that in your own homes, in your own families, when you're trying to give the gospel, when you're trying to live out the Christian faith, and, and they treat you like an enemy when you do anything in the world for them. You give them anything. Well, they hated Christ. What did Christ ever do to them? Well, when they hate you, they're just hating the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're supposed to bear in our bodies the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the Apostle Paul did. So who was troubling him? That first word, trouble. This trouble, we're going to see how significant it is. Look at, back, back to Galatians 6. Look at the next word. I think this is interesting. From henceforth, this is verse 17, Galatians 6, 17. From henceforth, let no man trouble me, for I bear... What's that next word? In my body, the marks of the Lord Jesus. It's, it's fun, as a pastor studying these texts to communicate them to someone else. I always learn something. I always learn something when I do this. And look what I learned here. When I think of this, the Apostle Paul bearing in his body the marks of the Lord Jesus, I picture the scars, right? Wouldn't you? And, and we're going to get to that. And that is definitely part of it. That's not in error. But this is not on my body. This is in my body. Remember what it said in chapter 4, verse 13? Look at what it says. For you know, or ye know, how through infirmity of the flesh I preach the gospel unto you. His body had been so abused for the Lord that he was weak, he was frail, he was sick. That persecution was revealed in him. He had to serve the Lord in great weakness. Now, how many of you have ever gone to work sick? And then how many of you had to go home? Yeah. Yeah. The Apostle Paul couldn't go home. He didn't have one. Yeah. He had to live with this infirmity. He had to live with this frailty. I was reading one author that said that the Apostle Paul was four foot eight inches tall. You see, God only uses short people. <laughs> you tall guys, God loves you, but He uses us. Okay? No, it's interesting. He was... <laughs> I'm in the wrong church to say that, aren't I? Oh, you giants, you freaks. Okay. I got back on the plane coming home. You know, the plane from Seattle to Denver, everybody's normal. The plane into Ohio, all these giants got on the plane. And you sit down next to them and, you know, the, the guy's trying to do his best to stay in his space, but there's no way you'd have to reform his molecules or something. So I'm riding the whole way back here. But anyway, the Apostle Paul was just a, a, a little man. But what a man. And his body was wrecked for the Lord. He bore in his body the marks of Jesus Christ. Why? So that the gospel of Jesus Christ could be preached. That was it. That was it. I wonder, I wonder what it would take to keep us from serving God. I've told you before, when I was in Africa, I was with a pastor who has a, a, a helps ministry, helping missionaries. And he had just been in China before he came to Africa where I was. And... Um, he was meeting with these house church, underground churches. Now, young people, when I hear underground churches, I thought they were in tunnels. But they're just hiding. They're just, these Christians, they're not allowed to have church there in China. And he met with some of these pastors, and they said, he said to them, what can we do to help you? Listen to what this Chinese pastor said. He said, leave us alone. He said, your American Christianity cannot stand persecution. Just... That was 10, 12 years ago. It just got me in my heart because I think in many cases it's true. Would you all agree with that? I wonder what it would take to keep us from serving the Lord. What would it do? It The Apostle Paul bore in his body. Listen to what Leonard Ravenhill wrote. This wandering Jew made war on all that made war on God and on the children of men. This prince of preachers and his foe, the prince of hell, spared each other no beatings, 
It was a free-for-all and no holds barred. Look closely at Paul, at that cadaverous countenance, that scarred body, that stooped figure of a man chastened by hunger, kept down by fasting, and plowed with the lictor's lash. That little body, brutally stoned at Lystra and starved in many places. That skin, pickled for 36 hours in the Mediterranean Sea. Add to this list danger upon danger, then multiply it with loneliness. Finally, count in the 199 stripes, three shipwrecks, three beatings with rods, a stoning, a prison record, and deaths so many that count is lost. And yet if one could add it up, all must be written off as nothing, because Paul himself thus consigned it. Listen to him. Our light affliction which is but for a little while. Imagine what a man of God. And they were troubling him because he wanted them to be free. Now look, imagine if I as your pastor, I come in here and I say, from now on, all you women, black dresses. That's it. Black dresses. That's it. Now all of you goth people are happy right now. Black dresses. That's it. You got to wear it over your head. You got to cover your face. <clears throat> Save on makeup. <laughs> That's it. And you men, you men, you've got to wear ties everywhere you go. Uh, I don't care if you're playing basketball. I don't care because we're going to look different than the world. Now, do we need to look different than the world? Yes, but I don't know that ties are the answer. <laughs> now, look. Imagine if I said that, and if I started imposing that on this church. You understand that none of that is in the Bible. Would you all agree with that? And so if I, start up, if I start imposing that on this church, it's going to cause problems in this congregation. Would you all agree with that? It's going to cause problems. Why? Because I'm taking away your liberty that's in Christ. I'm taking that liberty away. That's not what Paul was doing. Paul was giving them liberty. Paul was removing the shackles. Paul was removing the constraints. Paul was removing the legalism. And they still hated it because they were succumbing to the pressure of the culture, the pressure of their families, and the pressure of false religion. Look, liberty is sometimes harder than freedom. Or li liberty is sometimes harder than bondage. It's true. It's true. Now, in. That was in him. Now, let's, let's look at these marks. Let's look at these marks. He had scars from being beaten. He had scars from being stoned. But he called them the marks of the Lord Jesus. The marks of the Lord Jesus. It all belonged to Christ. They were not his scars. They were the scars of the Lord Christ. It marked him as Jesus Christ's servant. He wore these as a testimony to the Lord Jesus. So now let me ask you a question. It's a very simple question. Whose mark do you wear? The Apostle Paul said, From henceforth, trouble me no more, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Whose marks do you bear? Listen to what Alexander McLaren wrote. Oh, you Christian men and women, if you are not living a life of self-denial, if you are not crucifying the flesh with its affections and lusts, if you are not bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Christ may be manifest in your mortal body, what tokens are there that you are Christ's slaves at all? You know, the apostle at the beginning of the book calls himself the servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we understand by servant, we're not talking about somebody who gets paid. When Paul was talking about a servant, he was talking about a slave. He, and, and what is a slave? A slave is property. If a slave owner wanted to beat his slave, he could do it. If a slave owner wanted to kill that slave, he could do it. If that slave owner wanted to separate that slave from his family, he could do it. That slave owner, he was in charge and had the right to do anything he wanted to do with everything that slave owned. Anybody want to live like that? No, it's horrible. It's wicked. It's awful. But not when God is your master. You see, when we become servants of Christ, it's a voluntary thing. And do you know what happens? He becomes in control of our lives. He becomes in control of our bodies. 
He becomes in control of our possessions. He's in control of everything as we voluntarily yield it to Him. That's who Paul was. And what has God asked from us as believers? He gives us eternal life. He gives us all things freely to enjoy. He gives us ability and talent. He gives us... How about for us as Americans? We get to live here. We get to be free. We get a quality of life that so far surpasses everywhere else in the world. And then what does He ask from us? Holiness. Hey, how about you? Here's what I want from you. I want you... Here's what Jesus says. I want you to show me to the world. And He hasn't asked us to do it through scars. He hasn't asked us to do it through beatings and stonings. He asked us to do it through a holy life. We're, we're supposed to be a peculiar people. We're supposed to be different. What marks do you wear for Jesus Christ? Well, I'm not going to give that up. I'm not going to... Who says I can't do that? <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. It doesn't go together, does it? It doesn't go together. There are things that God wants us to do in order to be holy, that includes self-denial. But listen to what else McLaren said. But it is not only in limitations and restrictions and self-denials and pains that Christ's ownership of us ought to be manifest in our daily lives, and so by means of our mortal bodies. But if there be in our hearts a deep indwelling possession of the grace and sweetness of Christ, it will make itself visible, even in our faces, a beauty born of our communion with Him shall pass into and glorify even rugged and care-lined countenances. Let me stop there for a second. When you walk down the street, and I, I worked in Chicago for years, and you'd walk down the street in Chicago, and you could just look at people. You, you just look at them, and you knew. You know, you could look at the alcoholic and see the swelling in his face. You can look at the meth addict and, and see the pockmarked face and the bad teeth. And, and you can see, they're, they're, what are they doing? They're bearing in their bodies the marks of their lifestyle. Is that right? We've all seen, how many of you know exactly what I'm talking about? We get to bear in our bodies the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. And one of those marks ought to be joy. It, it, it ought to, it ought to, our Christianity, it really ought to reach our faces. And I'm terrible at this, man. I get so annoyed by everything in the world. The most impatient man in the world. Y'all love this. I was flying back. I was so tired. I hadn't gotten hardly any sleep this past week. I went through security and they had to recheck my bag and it, it just nightmare, okay? I got home. And Thursday, Laura asked me to check something on the computer, and my computer wasn't there. I had left it at security in Seattle. Yeah. It had everything on it, our tax returns, you name it, our whole life. Everything was on that computer. And I know that I'm supposed to be careful for nothing. I know that I'm not supposed to have any stress, but I thought I was going to have a heart attack. You know? And <laughs> I was so upset. I was so upset. And you know what I was thinking about? That security girl who had checked all my stuff. I was so thankful that in spite of myself, I went out of my way to be nice and kind to her. And she had taken that computer and put it away for me when I'd left it. Um, I wonder what would have happened if I'd been really nasty. She probably would have bounced it off the floor before she put it back in the thing or something, you know? And now here's the deal. I'm not saying, look at me, look how great I am. That was maybe the first time I was nice to a security person. <laughs> this is where our Christianity is supposed to make it into our lives, not just when we're in here, but especially when we're out there. In here, it's okay to reveal our hurts, and it's okay to reveal our frustrations. We don't have to put on a mask, a fake mask, when we're talking with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen? But out there, they should know that the problems of this world don't affect us the same way that they affect everybody else. Why? Because we have the marks of the Lord Jesus. He's changed us. I'll, I'll continue with McLaren. He says, There may be... And there ought to be in all Christian people manifestly, plainly visible, the tokens of the indwelling serenity of the indwelling Christ, 
And it should not be left to some moment of rapture at the end of life for men to look upon us, to behold our faces as it had been the face of an angel. But by our daily walk, by our countenances full of a removed tranquility and a joy that rises from within, men ought to take knowledge of us that we have been with Jesus. And it should be the truth. I bear in my body the tokens of His possession. I need to bear in my body the marks of Jesus Christ. Has Jesus Christ marked you? Has He marked you with joy? Has He marked you with peace? Has He marked you with forgiveness? Are you able to love because you have been loved? I'll show you something interesting. Keep your place here and go to Leviticus chapter 19. Leviticus 19. It's interesting. This word marks, where Paul says, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. There's only one other place in the Bible where the word marks is used. It's interesting. Let's read it. Leviticus 19, and look at verse 28. Ye shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. Only two places in the Bible where the word marks is used. Let's read that again. Leviticus 19.28 Ye shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. Are you bearing the marks of the culture? Or are you bearing the marks of the Lord Jesus? Who are you representing to the world? And it's interesting. Paganism has always included marking your body. It's always included branding your body. It's always included some type of mutilation of your flesh. Why? Because that flesh was created in the image of God. Now, we lost that image at the fall, but the design still reflects Him. It reflects Him. And we as believers especially, we belong to Him. Now, let me be very clear. Man, if you got a bunch of tattoos and stuff before you got saved, you are as much a Christian as any man or woman who have ever been saved. Amen? If you've got brands, if you've got scars from cutting yourself, praise God, now you're a testimony to the Lord Jesus Christ of what He can do in a person's life. Getting marked or having tattoos or, you know, you see these guys, how many of you have seen, it looks like they have dinner plates in their ears. Well, man, when I was a little kid, that was a national pornographic, I mean National Geographic. Remember that? How many remember seeing those when you were a kid? Now you see these kids and they've got these big rings and it's all stretched out in their ears and all this stuff. How many of you think that Christ is causing them to do that? No. No. They're bearing in their bodies the marks of the culture and of the lifestyle. Look, we just need to look like Christians. And we look like Christians in the way that we dress, certainly. Christian ought to look different than the world. We, we, we look like a Christian in the way that we behave. We bear the marks of Christ in the way that we give testimony to His name. And how many of you think that those people who were giving Paul trouble were bearing the marks of Jesus Christ? No. No. This is such an interesting text. And isn't it amazing the contrast in Scripture? The marks of Jesus Christ and the marks of the pagans? God says, don't do that. Don't do that. Let's live like Jesus Christ. Now, I've got to tell you, these young people, you guys, you guys are doing great. I appreciate you so much, the stand that you take in your schools, the stands that you take for the Lord. But eventually, someday, somebody's going to say, hey, the whole team is getting you know, an earring. The whole team is getting a piercing. The whole team is getting a tattoo. You know, the whole team's going to cut off their left leg. We're the hoppies. <laughs> yeah. don't, don't succumb to that stuff. You know a good answer for him? You know what? You can wear that mark. I bear in my body the marks of the Lord, of the Lord Jesus. Amen? Now again, I would not offend you guys for the world. I wouldn't do it. When I was younger, I probably would have. Not anymore. 
Not anymore. You know, if you came through a lifestyle and you've got all these tattoos, my brother-in-law, um, Justin Hall, he pastors out in Colorado. He's got Woody Woodpecker <laughs> on his arm when he was young. Um, look, I don't care. I don't care about that. But let's now, let's now give our bodies and our minds and our souls and our strength completely to the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't it a blessing that we can bear marks that identify with Christ? Praise the Lord. The Apostle Paul said, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Don't trouble me anymore. Don't trouble me anymore. I wonder what marks you are wearing. Hey, can we just as a church say, hey, let's, let's look like Christ. Let's, let's be like Christ. Let's say, Lord Jesus, this world is going farther and farther away from you. But I want to be drawn closer and closer to you. I want to know you. That I may know Him and the power of His resurrection. Uh-oh. And the fellowship of His suffering being made conformable unto His death. That's what Christ has for us. You know what Jesus Christ says to us? Come and die. Oh, but what a life. <laughs> what a life. Thank you, Lord, for Your Word. We love You so much. We're so thankful for everything that You do for us.